All right, everybody. I'll ask you to take your seats because we're going to get started. I'm uh, really excited to uh, be hosting this panel here at Boku tonight. Uh, it's going to be a really great panel, and, and we're going to have a great conversation. Um, for those of you that don't know, Boku is an open web technology company. We develop and adopt open web technologies, and our mission is to move the web forward. Uh, speaking of which, a quick plug. One of the companies in co-working has made a really awesome open web game called Collide. It's all open web technologies. It's like a multiplayer space shooter. And so if you care about the open web and you want your colleagues to know uh, that we can make really great games with it, definitely check that out and tweet about it. Uh, so I'm going to hand uh, the, the mic over to Anna, who's going to be uh, moderating this panel. You can ask questions through Google Moderate. Um, which is linked to from the Meetup page and also from the live stream on Google+. Plus. Uh, or uh, if we run out of those, uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. So uh, thanks a lot for coming. And let's have a quick round of applause for Anna and the panel. Thanks, Willis. All right, so um, this is a tag. There's a few members in the room as well. Uh, they can raise their hands and we'll see them. Um, we're the, uh, the technical architecture committee of the W3C, and it's sort of an oversight group trying to review the work of other groups and, and trying to steer them in the right direction. And at the moment, what we believe that direction to be in is to sort of unify the web into the direction of like becoming an actual sort of like an operating system, basically. Have exposed more primitives to developers and making it way better for, for applications. Um, I'll briefly uh, introduce the panel members. They'll each say something about themselves and what they're actively working on, and then we can uh, go to questions. Um, it's Alec Russell, Yehuda Katz, uh, Sergey, and Tim Berners-Lee. Um, I'll yeah, I'll just give the thing around. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. I work on Chromium and Blink, and I'm these days primarily working on the design for something called the Service Worker. Until Tom changes the name any time now, um, uh, if you have an idea for how to name it, uh, please talk to Tom. Um, yeah, and uh, and generally thinking about how to decompose uh, the primitives in the platform down to the lowest level possible. Hey, uh, I am a JavaScript programmer by day <laughs> and night. <laughs> um, most of what I've been doing for the past few years is just has been uh, getting involved in groups like this and also trying to get other JavaScript practitioners involved in, um, in these committees and uh, been working with Alex for a while now on basically the same thing, trying to figure out how to how to let people like us have access to things that until now were hidden and uh, stored in magic inside the browser somewhere. Um, so I think uh, Service Worker is basically a good example of, of how to deal with the fact that when browsers try to build offline, they build app cache. And what we would like is just primitives that we can work with and let the JavaScript library ecosystem build it out instead of having the browser guess. So uh, yeah, been doing a lot of stuff, but it's all focused around that. Hi, everyone. My name is Sergey, and I am from Russia. Uh, surprise. Uh, I'm very new to W3C, so I don't know uh, <laughs> what answer could I tell you. But if you're interested in something about Russia, you may ask me. I may. <laughs> I may also note that I'm a JavaScript programmer, surprise, and I'm working. Uh, all the previous was a joke because I really working in a large projects JavaScript. For for instance, it's uh, Yandex Maps API. So if you have any questions regarding uh, the architecture of big JavaScript systems, you can address it to me. Thank you. So, 
Tim Berners-Lee and I have been, I suppose, now over here since the web, when the web started and moved to Massachusetts. Then it was a, you know, the important thing for, to explain to everybody about the architecture was how declarative it was. And those times were very nice in a way that the web was this function where you get, you know, you put a URL, URL and you get out some and you get out something where more or less you know and if you put the same URL again you get the same thing out again <laughs> it was this sort of invariant which was, this function was this you know, there was a function which where things changed over time but then and then uh, and things got uh, and CSS was nice and, uh, and declarative and the whole thing you know when then there was this sort of declarative rush about uh, and I suppose it replaced a lot of web-based things. It replaced a lot of things which had been coded up, um, <clears throat> and, every, and even though everything was produced by programs running behind that, to the user it looked declarative. Look, the user it just looked like this static space to move through. And as time has gone on, then the JavaScript has got more, become more and more important to me on this arc now uh, to build the, this incredible computing system. And it, I think it's going to be very exciting. But I also wonder whether we are going to. Uh, whether after a while, it won't be long before we start getting desperate to uh, we find these, these huge heaps of, of code that are all dependent on each other and they're really difficult to manage because code always is in any system and whether we don't end up starting just making higher level declarative things again. All right, thanks everyone. Um, there was uh, one question. Uh, we had a Google moderator set up, but uh, there was only one question submitted. <laughs> um, so if you can all start thinking about questions while we address this one, that would be great. Um, uh, uh, just raise their hands, because I'm, I'm not looking at the Google moderator at this point. Uh, uh, the one question that we, had, we did get through was about promises and about what the it's, the question was like promises seem done now. Uh, what were some of the challenges faced, and, and who specifically have been involved on the tag? Um, I've been involved, but I'll, I'll let uh, Alex uh, answer this one. Uh, so, um, how far Maybe back do you want me to you start? Explain what, a, what. Ask if people know what promises are. Everybody know what a promise is? Hands up. Yes. OK, we'll call that three quarters. Uh, for the quarter of you who didn't raise your hands, they are a standard contract for something that is going to happen later or already. And it's one thing, and it may have already happened. That's it. That's all you need to know, but you'll be informed about it later. That's it. That's the whole contract. Um, also, it could fail. <laughs> TLDR. So it uh, turns out, in that description is uh, so many opinions that you can't possibly shake a stick at them. Um, luckily, we've had quite a few libraries that have tried and failed, my, my own included, and some that have succeeded, uh, not mine. Um, but from all of that, you, you get some sense for the problem space. And so early this year, we started to design Scrum with a bunch of people who care. Um, God, this mic is loud. Trying to come up, <laughs> trying to come up with a, a, a basic pattern for um, what the you may want to briefly mention promises a plus that yeah a, a, a basic um, set of constraints on the design the promises a plus stuff was sort of ongoing but we didn't really take it as a constraint anyway we ended up all in the same place which is a happy accident but it sort of uh, points at convergence which is great because it means that you know we may all be wrong but at least we're all wrong together <laughs> um, and so uh, this spring and summer we have gone through a bunch of iterations in what is uh, an unfortunately large design space uh, to come up with a standard contract. Um, and uh, between many people in a GitHub repo that I was running and then later in a GitHub repo that Dominic was running, folks like Mark Miller, Yehuda, um, Dominic Danicola, uh, Anna, who put promises in the DOM spec in the first place and spent a bunch of time iterating on it. Yeah. Um, we wound up getting uh, a proposal in this room last week accepted to get promises into ES6. Um, so you may not like them. There are parts of it that I don't like. Uh, but hold your fire, because having it done is better than having the thing that you want. Um, I promise you that that's true in this regard. Promise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I think just in general, one, 
the way to think about promises if you're not heavily using them already is that it allows you to make a request and not you yourself have to deal with the response and hand off that that thing that is going to happen to somebody else. So uh, when you use callbacks, um, basically the way that you have to write JavaScript code is that the person who makes the request also has to supply the callback that says what should happen when the request succeeds. Um, but sometimes you want to write code where the person who knows what request to make is not also the person who knows how to handle the response. And as you build increasingly decoupled JavaScript applications, you really do want to be able to say, hey, I know I need to make a, an AJAX request to this URL, but you know, Ember's going to put it into the DOM. Or Angular is going to put into the DOM, and I don't actually care about that part. So basically, having a thing which represents a future value that some other library or other part of your code can tack onto and see when the thing succeeded, and not force you to write both pieces of your code in the same place is basically what this is about. Having a way of saying, here is a future value. I, you don't have to care from whence it came. You don't have to know anything about how the request was made in the first place. It may not even be an AJAX request. It may be pulled out of some some local cache or something. Um, but you you care about applying it. That's that's basically the point of it. All right. So audience questions. Tom. Uh, so you mentioned that you were the kind of stuff that you guys are doing is turning the browser really into an operating system. Um, but then you mentioned how the nice thing about the web is that it's very clear. That's one of the beauty of the writing. So how do you strike a balance between something that's turning complete? And there's really an application runtime, and how do you kind of square that with the origin of the web, which is a very declarative document-oriented system? Like how do you strike? How do you balance those trade-offs? All right. So to to summarize in the mic, uh, how do you strike the balance between a Turing complete system and um, and a de declarative system, which was what the web originally was, but it's turning into more of a Turing complete system? Um, I'll start on the other end since Alex and Yehuda already talked, so Tim can give his views. Well, you layer them in two ways. One is, uh, well, so you start off. The, of course, the JavaScript sits in is a is a it's not declarative language, but it is a quasi static. It is a it is a set of files, <clears throat> and so you've got so the, it, that fits in as, as part of the model of the web. And then with that, of course, so then in a way, so. When I think in the future, hopefully, you'll also be able to link. You'll be able to invoke one bit of JavaScript from another, much more like inverting it between HTML files, much more fluidly, and in, with, without being so constrained using such paths you have when you run like Python or, or Java or something, uh, so that you can use the sort of the power of the web and links and things. But then, uh, what typically people do is that they write a big uh, procedural system, and then they realize. That it takes the parameters it takes are quite. Then they pass in all these. First they pass in some parameters. Then they pass in some options. Then they pass in some op set of options which are in fact themselves nested quite complicated data structures. And then they realize that actually writing these in JSON is a pain, and there's a better language for it. And then they p write a parser for the language and they define the language. And then you've got another declarative language which has got all kinds of nice declarative properties, and it's just implemented in terms of big, big layer. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see. New declarative languages being bootstrapped using the using the procedural stuff, and in a way we, we might be able to get some uh, sort of san keep keep our sanity in some ways like that. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. I think the idea um, I'm gonna let you uh, make. I want you to speak after me. Um, I think the idea is that we sort of have seen the story where. We say declarative is very important, so let's just design the declarative start part from the top down. We've seen that story over and over again, like I said, cache manifest, um, how the image tag works, how the script tag works. We've seen this story. And over and over again, what we found is that when we start or eventually provide primitive forms, people are able to do a lot of things with those primitive forms. And eventually, like uh, Sir Tim said, eventually people end up building declarative forms on top. Um, now, I think one thing that sucks about the current situation is that building a declarative form on top itself requires a big blob of JavaScript. So just getting at the HTML that's on your page requires letting the parser run and then going and scanning the DOM for something. So uh, as an example, and I think it's much more desirable to have hooks inside of the browser's parser process that let you say um, the browser is going through the declarative form. Now it sees something it doesn't understand. Script, go do something. Um, so have your own image tag that maybe uses canvas under the hood or something like that. And I think that's sort of where a lot of us are, are heading with this is um, exposing primitive forms that 
aren't really designed to be used as ever-increasing balls of JavaScript, but more are designed to allow people to build declarative forms once we figure out what it is that we want, instead of trying to figure out everything ahead of time, which I think doesn't work. Yeah, so I think you're here to pass the mic to me because I spent a couple of years working on web components. So um, having built uh, one of these very large piles of JavaScript, which attempts to do exactly what Yehuda was saying, which is to say, oh, look, I've got a gigantic DOM of completely meaningless divs, um, which happen to have attributes hung off of them, which I have imbued with meaning via the power of JavaScript, um, you eventually go, oh, my god, seriously, can I just, can I just plug in here? Because, like, there's so much utility in HTML to be able to tie um, commonly agreed semantics to standard UI and then configure it a little bit. Um, but that has really drastic limits. Um, and those limits are largely based on what we expect our platform to do. And to the extent that HTML has been a very good carrier of stuff that we already know how to do, uh, it's been wonderful at that. And I think it's not... Uh, I think it's not tarnishing HTML's legacy to suggest that what HTML does when it encounters an HTML element is to find the tag name, look up the constructor in the map, create an instance of that thing, pass in the attributes as arguments to the constructor, and carry on its merry way. That's exactly what we do inside of Blink. And I think that's exactly what every other HTML engine has ever done. All we are suggesting is that that machinery should be made user accessible so that we don't have to give up on HTML to go do slang. Right, which is what it is when you sit down and you take a div or a span and you add a bunch of CSS classes or extra attributes, data dash attributes, that mean something that HTML didn't have a pre-configured list or grid or something type for. Um, you mean something else, something HTML doesn't say yet. And if enough of us say it, well, we eventually would like a path back to HTML encoding that. And if there's anything I think we can do here, it's to use little bits of JavaScript that are empowered to plug into the parser um, to help us inform how we should evolve HTML in the future. Because I think what we're doing today is alchemy. I think we're not doing any sort of real science. Um, when people talk about the semantic, semantics of HTML, I think they're mostly guessing. Uh, and I think they're guessing based on a little bit of data. Uh, so since early this year, I've put together a project called Meaningless, uh, which is a Chrome extension which attempts to look at the actual real-world semantics that JavaScript imbues with HTML elements um, uh, based on DOM mutation of events, uh, sorry, mutation observers. So we look at not just the stuff that came down the wire when you sent it, but also all of the ARIA roles and states, all of the um, schema.org attributes, all of the microformats, and um, pretty much all of the other ad hoc stuff that you're going to add to one of these one of these documents, yeah, the Facebook invented elements, all the custom element stuff. So um, this is an attempt to go take an observatory to the web to see what we're doing with HTML. Um, what is it that we're actually turning HTML into? And it turns out almost all of the web is divs, right? <laughs> almost all of the web that you interact with every day turns out to be divs and spans. Um, and those are largely about styling. Divs and spans are about you putting together a block or an inline block. <laughs> Um, that, those are your choices. So, uh, and we mean a lot more than that. We mean a lot of things that HTML doesn't have words for today. Or we mean things also. We try to take HTML as far as it'll go, and then we try to turn it a little bit with an adjective or an adverb here and there uh, to get it to carry other meaning. Um, so letting you into the parser, letting you play as a first-class citizen in this world to do smooth extension, as Guy Steele would say, uh, in the language is, is not heresy. It's just us voting with our feet to a better world that HTML can then come back through and standardize. I would like the Oxford English Dictionary of HTML. Can I have it now, please? Yeah, I, I think a, a good example of this whole thing um, on, the, on the HTML front is back when Apple released the Retina MacBook, MacBook Pro? I don't know what the first one was. Uh, what happened was that there, all of a sudden all these websites couldn't display well in, in on Retina screens. And it turned out that it was actually really hard to make that work. And if you looked at what Apple was doing, they were doing insane things to make it work on their own websites. And so there was this mad dash in the W3C to try to figure out a way to standardize some solution. And what ended up happening was pretty messy and complicated. But I think largely the reason why it was so messy and complicated was that the the process had to happen top down. It was like a, a, a emergency, essentially. And instead of... Um, Say, instead of our first instinct being, let's write a little library that creates a new element, 
uh, we can call it the picture element, which is what they ended up uh, calling it, and we'll have it have the behavior that we need. We'll have it go figure out what the screen size is, and we'll have it look at its child elements and um, render the right thing, either maybe into a canvas or maybe using an image tag, right? We, uh, instead of having all that machinery available to us, our first instinct was to say, W3C, please, this is an emergency. Solve this problem for us right now. And I think the problem is that then a year went by, and I, I don't know if we'll ever standardize anything here. It may end up being possible. Um, but a year went by before really any meaningful progress was made, and that was because we felt like we needed to do a top-down. So I think in general, the idea of exposing enough primitives so people's first instinct is not, oh my god, if I have to hook into that, what kind of crazy shenanigans am I going to have to pull? Like, wh what kind of crazy work am I going to have to do to m allow myself to get into that process? But of course, I'll make a custom element. That's obviously the right thing, I think, is, is what we want. I think that answers one of Paul Iris' question. He's been submitting a bunch <laughs> uh, about whether or not uh, new features uh, should be um, polyfillable. Um, so we go to the next one, um, which is. Uh, sure. I don't know why it took them a, a year, but if you want to do something quickly, you can go w3c.org and, you know, and start a community group. And, uh, and if. And if you, you know, if, if something like that comes up, don't wait for a year. <laughs> just, just do it. But you, and you can do it within a community group, which gives you a way of, you know, firing up other things and interconnecting people. But don't feel that it takes a year. Yeah. So people should. Yeah. It's okay. We'll, we'll go to the next question. We don't have to say any, everything on this topic. I think. Um, tra trailing behind. Native's feature set doesn't seem like a strong strategy in the long term. What are we missing from the platform that takes advantage of the web's intrinsic strengths? Do URLs work for discovery in our multi-device future? Who wants to tackle this one? Yehuda. Yeah. Uh, so I think, let me just make sure I... I don't see. In the microphone, like the camera. Ah. Ah, oh, hi. Hey, hey, what's up? Uh, so I think the question was um, something like, it seems bad that we're spending a lot of time trying to catch up with native. Probably this is not a war we can ever win. We should instead be thinking about what things the web is already better at native and try to help help le use those things to leverage, uh, leverage those things to make good applications. And URLs is one of those things. Something like that is roughly the question. Cool. OK, awesome. Uh, yeah, I my opinion. Uh, from the last year or two of my own personal work is that URLs are probably the web's most important strength. I think URLs are probably... Oh. Woo. <laughs> uh, I think URLs are probably the thing that's going to... that has been here from the beginning and is, and is probably the thing that's going to be here in 10 or 20 or 30 years, even if the entire application runtime is replaced with the WebGL context. I think people will still be typing in URLs in a URL bar. Um, so I, th I think URLs are, are crucially important. And I think there's a lot of, so the pro platform has added a few primitives recently um, in push state that has enabled people, uh, frameworks like um, Ember to build tools around this. I think um, there's a couple things that need to happen. Um, one of them is I think we as consumers of frameworks need to demand that URLs are considered a first class citizen and that t a typical usage of a framework does not result in bad URLs. Um, so this is something that I care a lot about, and I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how to build something like that. Um, the other thing is related to the service worker stuff, which is um, I think it's crucially important that it be possible to intercept navigations. And um, if, you, if basically what you want to build is a JavaScript application that is only using JavaScript for, um, to replace, you have like a shell, and you're replacing a, a center area, and you're clicking around, and, you're, and you just want to make, you just want basically increased performance. So you maybe download a JSON payload or Markdown and you do the rendering on a client, something like that. Um, I think we need a mechanism for allowing us, us to intercept URL requests in the client and having some code that actually answers instead of always having to um, go back to the server for those things or do everything in JavaScript like a la Ember. And, that, and that's something that's pretty exciting. But I think, I, I, just to reiterate my earlier, the thing I said first, which is I think it is crucial that we as web developers wake up to the fact that most people who write JavaScript applications for the first time screw up URLs. And increasingly, people who use JavaScript applications feel like things are broken. I think for a long time, Gmail, 
uh, or, or sorry, uh, Google Maps had this problem where if you wanted to share something with a friend, you couldn't grab the URL. You had to punch a ticket and pull out your, your URL from some random icon on the screen. I think that was terrible. And I think as JavaScript developers and as users, we need to make sure Basically, if, we, if JavaScript causes us to lose the URL in the platform in the first place, then we have no strength, right? Our strength is only there because URLs actually are a good thing. So um, I think we need to make sure that we demand good URL support from our frameworks. Uh, in short, I cannot imagine the web without the URLs. The URLs is the thing that made the web. and. Uh, I don't think that we lose it. It's impossible. If we lose in, uh, we lose in URL, so then the web begins dividing. And that's not the thing we want to face, in my opinion. Yes, right, URLs are the, fun, the fundamental building book of the, of the web. You know, HTTP is secondary to it, uh, and HTML is tertiary. Uh, you can easily use HTTP to, to move other things in HTML. You can use a URL, not easily. If you introduce another protocol like HTTP or HTTPS, or, uh, you know, then that is, there's a big cost. So I think it's, imp and you have to do things, it would be a good idea to get, you know, it all discussed with these people, for example, at the tag, and make, and there should be a, hoops to jump through because that's the very important um, uh, flexibility point for us to keep. So when we realize, realize we need a namespace which has got very different properties from HTTP and, when we, and, we, and we don't want to just keep morphing HTTP, which is also a good idea, then we need to have that colon. We need to keep the HTTP colon on the front so that we can use it as a flexibility point for making a really significant change. What I don't like is that what could m mess this up is if people say, oh, actually, we're going to use, we're going to start renting out uh, URI scheme names, and we're going to put them in DNS, or we're going to make them, have, allow you to register them. Uh, every app will be able to register six new URI scheme names. And of course, apps are generating URI scheme names sort of every, every few seconds out there. But uh, so there's, a, so there's a, 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 heads up, there's a danger there. We might lose that flexibility point. Um, the next top photo question is from Boas. Um, there was a panel here uh, about a week and a half ago uh, with uh, TC39 members, the committee behind uh, JavaScript. And uh, in that panel, uh, Adam Wurstbrock, uh, the uh, editor of the, the specification, um, said that the web as a platform would probably last at least uh, 30 years, just like uh, the 30 years of mainframes and PCs. Um, and the question to the panel is like, how long do you think it will last? <laughs> like, well, uh, maybe you can correct my timing, but if if it's thirty years, we got ten more, right? No, we had twenty-four and a half, so five years. So uh, start getting your resumes ready. <laughs> kid. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I um, a be because the URL is the fundamental building block. I think a better analogy would be the telephone system, um, and the telephone system. You still mostly use telephone numbers to call people, uh, unless you're in a very, very tech space. So a hundred years later, we, things are changing a little bit, but it took a long time and a lot of infrastructure changes. Um, and I think the URL is a powerful enough concept for sharing. Uh, I think increasingly the things that we do using the internet. So I think the internet's not going away. Um, and increasingly, the things we do with the internet are share content you're looking at, save it for future use, um, make multiple, you know, fork off where you are and look at it on another, on another window. And all these things are features of, of the URL. Um, so I, I would be much more bullish than a 30-year time frame. Uh, I think what we are looking at with the, with the web is actually, if you look at the URL as the core building block, it's more, it's more fundamental. Uh, it's not fundamental infrastructure, because that, that changes, just like the, the first person who ever used a telephone wasn't, uh, didn't have an automated system. Um, it's more fundamental naming, right? What we have with the, with the web is a way of describing, um, describing a thing and getting to it easily and sharing it with your friends. And I, 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 don't, have, I don't know what the upper bound on that is, but I don't, I don't think we're particularly close to it. Uh, you know, if you try to look what are the new things that are upcoming into our 
virtual reality, then you should know that every one of the things, that's some uh, offline things that are going online, uh, have uh, has a URL because URL is a method to address a thing. So I would expect that the role of the URLs would increase, not decrease. So I see no reasons and to think that uh, the current web platform may degrade in uh, years. Uh, that's not like mainframe, which is a mode of operate, but uh, the mode, the thing that address everything in the world, and it could be extended very and very much more. And uh, there is lots of things that should be addressed and still has not URL, and they will have URL. So the future of URLs is quite light, <laughs> not dark. And just talking about the underlying internet technology, it, uh, it's actually already been around for 44 years. It was 1969. They put the internet together and they designed an internet packet. And basically the same internet packet, when they designed it, it would go over 100 border or 300 bits per second line. And now it may go over 300 megabits per second line or maybe a 300 gigabits per second line. So that, no, nothing, can you think of any other technology? Nobody's driven a train, designed a train, which would then, over time, evolve to go a million times as fast. <laughs> okay, that just ha doesn't happen in any, ever, any, any other field, any other technology. So there is a certain amount of scalability and time-proofness here, which is it's already, we're already doing better than some of the original, some of the other engineering. So I have a follow-on question. How many of that, those original um, bits per second were used for sending cat ASCII? <laughs> All right. Uh, there's another one from Paul Irish. Uh, his questions seem to be particularly popular. <laughs> um, where are the bottlenecks in evolving the web platform? Uh, is it the spec writers, people hacking on browsers, uh, boat anchor browsers, um, and is it possible to move faster? Uh, anyone particularly keen on Yehuda? Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Um, Actually, I did something I pinged Alex about for the first time this week that made me very, very happy. Somebody submitted a bug to Ember that said, um, "There's a, you know, I'm hitting this issue in Chrome, and then someone investigated, and they said, oh, it, it exists in the current Chrome, but it's, it's not there in beta channel. And I replied, it's an evergreen browser. We are not fixing it. Have a nice day, basically. Like, it'll be, it'll be fixed soon and within a few weeks, and it does not make sense for us to put some hack into Ember right now to work around a this obscure edge case in, in, in Chrome. And I felt very, that was the first time that I was ever able to do that, but I, it felt very good. Um, and I th so I think for sure boat anchor browsers are a problem. And I've said this a few times. Am I being recorded? Awesome. Um, no. Uh, but I'm personally very, very scared of, of the situation with Safari. I've said this a lot. Um, I know other people are much nicer than me. Uh, IE, IE at this point is a slow and steady browser for me in the sense that it doesn't, it's not the first browser to pick up features, but I have not seen any important features that IE has basically nuked and all the important features IE is like interested in and once they make it further, far enough along, it seems like they'll do it and they have a, a good history of that. Um, Safari is definitely um, in building up a bolus of features that they are essentially Avoiding implementing, and there's, and I think it's reasonable to assume that they might eventually, they may choose to never implement a whole bunch of important features. Um, I think it's good on the Chrome team to keep the pressure up on that, um, and the Firefox team. Uh, but there's definitely, I definitely have a lot of fear there, and I think because of the fact that there are still slow and steady browsers and browsers that are not implementing anything at all, and many of us have to write code for those browsers, it's. I would love for the specs to move faster, but they're just not, they're not the things holding us back at this point. Um, I think the specs are probably moving at roughly the same pace as IE at this point, um, which is, so the specs are slow and steady, and I would be very sad if all the browsers were as fast as Chrome and Firefox. Um, then, then I would say the bottleneck was, was the standards process. But at this point, 
at this point, um, Safari really needs to, to deal with this. All right. Uh, the next question is from uh, Matt Andrews in London. Uh, AppCache has got a lot of flag for its flaws, but it does work. See Financial Times. Uh, has good browser support, and its replacement event worker feels a long way off and not declarative. Can we not fix caching masters? No prefer offline fallback. Add a JavaScript API, etc. first. Sorry, I just got it. I just got to take this. I'm sorry. Um, so the answer to the question was, um, can we? So the que so the question was, can we implement a bunch of new stuff in browsers? Um, and I'm happy to tell you that the answer is yes, we can. Um, so we could fix the set of uh, relatively small warts in app cache that were listed, um, and they would have an impact in about the same time frame that it'll take us to ship the event worker. Right, so uh, service worker. That's what we're calling it, service workers. Um, uh, and so the choice of do I would do I get the very powerful low-level primitive that lets me get myself to jail in the future, or do I get a couple of band-aids over a thing that doesn't? Um, declarativeness is a virtue uh, once you know where you're going. Um, sort of sort of being locked into a particular trajectory is is immensely wonderful once you know that that's a good place to be going. Um, my I think informed, I hope informed, uh, statement about what we've done with offline to date has been that we have no idea where we're going. We have not given web developers enough power to be able to express what they need to do in the script often enough for us to even be able to look around the world and go, yeah, most people want this. Like, we have a, an idea about what, what most people might want to do, but we're not most people. Like, we are all individual, peculiar people who have specific needs. And until you can go poll the whole world, um, and say, hey, if you put yourself in this situation and, and imagined that this was your problem and came up with a solution, would it look exactly like mine? Um, until you can actually do that by observing the world as it is, uh, you're not doing science, you're doing alchemy. You're doing prediction. Um, and so I reject the thesis that declarative is necessarily good up front. Uh, I would like for us to have a vibrant ecosystem of people who are trying to solve their own problems that we can observe and say, okay, great. Everybody's doing this. It's really expensive. It's slow. Let's go put that in a spec. Let's go extract the things that are really valuable and turn them into a high-level form that happens to be extensible should you need to get yourself out of jail in the future. Yeah. I also, so it may well be that the Financial Times eventually figured out how to make AppCache twist to their whims. Um, but almost everybody I know of, including Facebook and many other large companies, have basically fallen back to the point where mostly what they do with AppCache is is produce better error messages in the case that you are offline. So you may have seen, for example, that if you go to Google when you're offline, it doesn't show you the normal 404 page. It shows a nice, like, hi, I'm Google, and you're offline. Here, learn some more about this. Um, <laughs> and I think I th Google Docs has tried really hard to make AppCache work, and it's a pretty annoying experience offline if you can make it work. I just, I actually reject the claim that AppCache is mostly working. I also reject the claim that it's mostly interoperable. Um, I, th I think the core problem with AppCache was that it was designed to solve a particular problem that it turns out that very few people need, so everybody was forced to build their applications in that model. I, I, the example that I always give that was in one of those uh, Band-Aid hacks is, and it just give, shows you how hard it is to design this stuff up front. Um, imagine that you want to build a website, and when the website is offline, you would like to show offline data, but when the website is online, you want to hit the URL. So imagine that you are building a blog. And you would like to, when the user is offline, obviously you want to show them the last thing that you downloaded. But when the user is online, you don't want to show them the last thing you downloaded. You would like to always get up-to-date information because it's a blog. Um, AppCache does not allow this. So this scenario, very simple scenario, is not possible with AppCache, and there's no escape valve. So what you have to do, and you've probably seen some apps that try to do this, is you show the old content, and then you show a little yellow bar, or a yellow thing that says, this app has refreshed. Please reload, except it's a blog. So no, that's a stupid thing. So anyway, the, the, po the point that I'm making is d solving offline in a declarative way involves, as Alex said, n much, much more knowledge of what the problem is than we actually have. And I think e much worse than that 
it makes it impossible for the ecosystem to actually try to solve the problem themselves. So instead of, instead of now having two or three years of experience with people like Facebook and, and Financial Times and Google um, actually using the, the primitive tools to figure out what the requirements are, we have three years of people twisting their applications into the broken app cache model. And I think in general we are better off we are better off shipping primitives that libraries can use. And I'm actually a big fan of browsers using those primitives to build their own libraries that they think might be a good idea. But in that case, if the browser gets it wrong, if you know if Google ships a piece of Polymer that is offline support and it uses the primitive and, and Google got it wrong, totally fine. Everybody can go on and do their own thing and not wait three or four years to convince a spec editor to make a change. So I, I yeah. Do you want to say something, Dan? You have to say it in the mic. Yeah. Can I just make one short point on this? I'm Dan Applequist, um, and I'm hi, one of the co-chairs of the group. So um, I, did, I said I didn't want to be on the panel, but I just felt like on this on this particular topic, I think you know, I used to say two years ago, no, 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 I don't really don't want to be in the panel. Okay, all right. Oh, shoot. Uh, I used to say this exact thing, like, well, Financial Times is using the uh, is using app cache, so it must be okay, right? You know, but like two years later, I found myself saying, Financial Times is using app cache, so it must be okay, right? And nobody else has built applications to that level that Financial Times has built, and I think they've only done that because they've really put a lot of engineering resource on it to do a lot of very custom stuff, and. Um, I think that's really proof that we need something new. We need a new approach. Um, I think it's a, it's a real strong proof point that you don't see a lot of, hu you know, a huge number of great offline web applications out there. So we need something new, obviously. And we also have tons and tons of platforms that are, that are built in, right? Uh, so and we also have, basically every single platform is building App is saying basically abandon ship on app cache if you want to build offline apps zip up your stuff and say, send it to the app store and people are actually thinking that this is a good idea I think that's also a proof point that we have done something wrong here all right the next question is in a different direction um, if URLs are significant and the content bound to that resource identifier why is versioning not a first class citizen in, on the web um, yeah why can't you query a website for, for its original version? Is what the question comes down to, it seems. I think Tim might, might have it. Um, good idea. Yeah, why not? Um, and, and it, I mean, there's, there, there have been, uh, so, you know, the, the often, the, the, in fact, there's a whole, you know, there's a lot of, Work on metadata. There's a lot of work in provenance and things. Uh, so, in fact, in a lot for a lot of things. Uh, so, for example, uh, there's existing protocols you can use to, if you want to expose that sort of thing. For example, you can put link red equals meta and point for, uh, in, which you can just put in the HTTP header, and you can then point to a, to a metadata file which contains, uh, which gives information about the provenance of thing. If you look at the stuff, the provenance of working group, you know, there's some areas where provenance is really, really important, uh, like in scientific data or like in museums and uh, like in court uh, histories and things like that. So you'll find that some areas, uh, 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 people have gone into this in great detail. Look at the look at the look at uh, prof the, the output of the work, the the provenance working group. If you want to see you know the sort of um, uh, ways standards for writing that sort of metadata, I think. Well, you know, why doesn't it happen across the web? I think partly because the needs for provenance and the types of versioning that go on are, uh, are kind of different. And uh, it's rather, I think, if we try to force everybody into the same model, it would be a disadvantage. But there are, but, but you know, but but there is, there's there's all the building blocks you, uh, to allow to to export and allow people to find the uh, the. Um, the, the, the provenance and where things have come from and, and, and previous versions and things. Yes, it would be, um, uh, I could go on more uh, with it. Uh, it would be a rat hole. Right. Um, there are some questions related about uh, security. Apparently, Doc Corkford made comments. Uh, 
that the HTML5 spec is not taking security into account, um, and what are people's thoughts on this. And also, when we expose more low-level features, such as WebGL, uh, that increases the attack surface since you're closer to your hardware, is that a problem, or is that OK? Do you know more about what Doug actually said? I, I just, I, it's hard to answer the question without knowing. Well, well a few years ago, he basically said the surface area was fine. So I. Okay, more complicated, you should make it secure, and more surface area was getting secure. I don't know. It was basically, the question was as fake as I said it was. So, so um, we, we could probably call Doug. Uh, but to uh, to channel him a little bit, um, there there is an argument in security engineering about a chosen protocol attack, right? Which is to say that the more cruft you add on, eventually, you know, the per the combinatorial effects of the permutations that you've sort of left around to combine are things that will bite you in the ass. Um, this is true. This is absolutely the case. Um, and so your choices are to attempt to have a simpler system or to have a system with defense in depth. And if I have my druthers, it will always be a system with defense in depth. Because no matter how simple a system is, you can get it wrong. Um, and uh, the best research we have about human frailty suggests that all of us get something wrong all the time, unless your name is Dan Bernstein, in which case you get a gold star. Did you write Qmail? No? OK. You don't get a gold star. So for the rest of us, we have to figure out how we're going to get by, right? And so our, I believe our best tools for getting by involve not trusting ourselves very far. They involve turning off the greatest amount of privilege possible. They involve giving ourselves tools to say no more often to ourselves so that we are put in constraints that generate um, reasonable conversations among actors we can reason about. Big boxes that look like I'm talking to a secured thing over there, and it's a privileged conversation versus lots of little fine-grained things that I have to reason about at every moment. Little fine-grained things that you have to reason about are those permutations incarnate. This is probably why I am not a huge proponent of secure ECMAScript or many of the other initiatives that have come along to try to lock down JavaScript. I think you should put it in a box, and you should make that box as strong as you can, and you should put it in many different boxes. You should make it. You should sink them in the bottom of the ocean, and you should throw away the keys um, in a different ocean, if at all possible. Um, but you should never attempt to build one lock that will keep everyone out, because one lock that will keep everyone out only requires one attack to succeed. It doesn't require getting the deepest ocean trawler you can, and then figuring out 12 different locks. Yeah, so I agree with with that, I have I sort of have a different uh, angle on this. I think people's perception, if you just look at the platform, is basically every time you add a new feature, you add new surface area and the comet explosion, et cetera. That appears that feels true. Um, I think one way to mitigate that is to not constantly add new special case capabilities to the platform. So instead of adding ten offline caching features which th with their own internal magic that have to work. Um, if you instead expose one offline, uh, one caching primitive and you have all the additional features that the platform provides built on top of that caching primitive, then um, you, you can lock down the caching primitive and everything else is built on top. So um, an example of this, maybe there are some security issues in app cache. Um, so you might think, well, if we have app cache and also the, um, and al also the service worker, then, oh my god, now we have two security holes. But what you should do instead is you should add the service worker, and then you should rebuild app cache on top of the service worker. And now there's only one security hole. And we should increasingly say um, there's all these HTML tags. Instead of having each HTML tag have its own individual appeals to random C++ code, in, um, as much as possible, they should all be built on the same um, DOM primitives that we secure one time. And then those system, all those tools that, that we, as we add more and more of them, if at all possible, the new features should be built in, t in terms of existing primitives that we already know are secure and that we have already spent a lot of energy securing. In case it wasn't obvious before, I was talking about sandboxing. <laughs> um, one of the things that we've spent tons and tons of energy on the Chrome team in doing, and the IE team has to their benefit, um, is, is putting C++ code in a box in a box that, uh, if it blows up, it does not harm anyone else, right? Um, and we do that all the way down the chain, from the JavaScript VM 
to the GL commands that get sent across WebGL, we actually put those in a buffer and they're all verified before we send them out to the GPU to rewriting all those GPU commands in such a way that they're ne never actually hitting the other side directly, right? We are actually take, putting an air gap effectively between your code and the actual machine so that you never actually run a thing that says, please go get a thing to, from the network. It actually calls an API which sends an IPC from one process to another, a process with very low permissions to a process with slightly more permissions to go do that thing on your behalf. Um, and that's how you reason about it. You winnow it down to a very small set of things um, which you can actually go and validate and you can start to talk about. And you put those things in very large boxes where they can go and live their own lives but have very small, very tightly, contrained, tightly constrained conversations with each other. And that's how you win. You make um, very secure boxes that talk to each other over very, very small channels. In, in case I wasn't clear, I was mostly. I think we're both talking about basically the same thing. But uh, my my perspective is mostly just a response to the perception that every time the platform adds a new feature, it has to, by definition, increase complexity. And I'm I'm just saying if the platform if the new feature is built on top of basically if you write a JavaScript library, you have not increased the security surface area uh, in the platform. So if you write new features as though as if you were writing a JavaScript library, then you have not increased the security surface area of the platform. Um, the moderator thing is down, but um, I remember Tom asking a question about um, that some people still hold a standards board is in disdain. And um, is that a reasonable thing for these people to do, or should they change their perception, like are, are things changing or going in the right direction? Uh, I'm looking at Dan. I think he might have like a thing to say since he's on the panel now. Yes, they should absolutely be held in disdain. <laughs> no. Um, I think one of the things that we talked about earlier is the community groups. I think that's one one way in which W3C is trying to get faster, get more responsive to the community. Um, I think all standards groups need to be held to account by the community of practice to which they are delivering. Um, and I think community groups and things like this and, um, you know, uh, multiple, multiple touch points, Twitter, anything, you know, can, can be used in that way to get, uh, to get more and more feedback and a, a better, faster feedback loop between implementers, between practitioners, and uh, and the people that are that are writing the standards. And I th I see that happening more and more these days. So. You should hold a standards group and just uh, and who asked the question? It was, it was yours. It was yours. If it deserves to sustain, so you should yeah you should hold them accountable. Uh, before we started, when W3C was not there, uh, I held. Uh, I admit, sort of uh, the ISO system in disdain because uh, when I was working for a small company, I couldn't afford to buy the standards, uh, and they certainly weren't available on the web. Uh, but then the web wasn't there, uh, and uh, but they, uh, but also they were made by a vote between nations, uh, and I thought, you know, whereas, but I, but the IETF I held in huge regard and. When, so I started going to IETF meetings, and I tried to do a lot of the W3, you know, a lot of the web standardization in the IETF. We had an HTML working group. In fact, there were two things which went wrong. The reason we made W3C was not because the IETF we uh, had any disdain for the IETF, which was which, which is a great organization, uh, and largely you know, we modeled W3C on it. The difference, uh, one difference was we, we, in fact, for the markup stuff. We needed these people just didn't they weren't in the IETF. If, we, if you got something reviewed in the IETF and it was all about markup, you just didn't get the right people looking at it. So we, uh, part to some extent, had to put together a different group of people for the HTML stuff. Uh, a lot of them uh, had come out of some of them had come out of the mark, other markup communities. Uh, but also, like the X consortium, the idea was we had to hire people, and the X consortium was had people and wrote code. And it had to produce a new version every because the manufacturers wanted this needed this stuff to go. So the, the, the you know the the command was yes, we need new versions of the web coming out every now and again. We need somebody who's got release authority on that. And so when the consortium started, it was a bunch of staff writing specs, and the work there weren't working groups, there were editorial review groups, which just were people were groups from the manufacturers that came and reviewed the stuff we were doing. 
and then they became working groups because folks said, "No, nah, look, yeah, if you're doing stand, you're doing effectively standards, so you have to work like a standards body." And we got people like Carl Cargill ejected violently on some famous occasion, and 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 they and they said, "You need a process," and so we're much nicer working without a process. So it turns out that when you build a standards body, you can try to be fast, and you can try to be fair, and you can try to be good, and uh, when you and you obviously try to do all those three things at once, and there's always a trade-off. So what you end up doing, if you tweak a standards body, you end up making it a little less fair or a little less fast or a little less good. And it's constantly, in W3C, you can see it's in turmoil, constantly being pulled in all these directions, with people trying to cut corners, trying to get everything, working their nuts off, trying to make sure that they, you know, trying to put extra time in so they can be fair enough to everybody while still producing something really good as, as soon as possible. And so... Uh, if you want, you know, if you feel like you might find, you know, like for example, you hear somebody say, "Oh, W3C, I'll take you so long." So long. Go look at it. Look at why it takes a long time. Why? Because you get bright people in a room trying to make a good design. Yeah, that takes a while. Okay. So uh, you know, if you can think of a better, if you can go to, if you um, think that the W3C could be better, different, well, go and join the community group, which is actually revising its process document. Okay, you can go meta on it, okay? And because it's constantly revising its own, the, the, the idea is it's constantly revising its own process. Uh, yeah, I'm sort of on, the, on that same note, um, although I know uh, I don't want to be too, too happy because there are definitely things that could be improved and I don't, I don't want to make it sound like everything's perfect. But I think there's a couple of constraints specifically on the interoperable web that I think people need to keep in mind. Um, when thinking about how long things take. So I think, I know a lot of Node people are like, oh my god, those W3C, stodgy W3C guys, takes them so long to do stuff. Look at us, we're just zipping away, so amazing. Um, there's, two <laughs> there's two constraints that the web has that they do not have that are the main reason why it takes so long. Uh, number one, there are many interoperable browsers, and as users of the web platform, as developers on the web platform, uh, we would really like it if all the browsers agreed on the features that were being added so that once we want to go use them, they are actually there. Uh, you could imagine that Chrome would be able to move quicker, just like Apple can move quicker in iOS, but then when you went to go use the feature, it would not be found in your favorite browser, or your least favorite browser, <laughs> probably. Um, so there actually is, there is a necessary process that is unpleasant because the, the le your least favorite browser is probably um, the least... Uh, helpful in the committee process, but you really do want them to eventually say, yes, I agree, I will implement that. You really do want a process where Internet Explorer and Safari um, and Opera, some days, if they're still around, no, they're blinked now, uh, and, and Firefox and Chrome could all get together in a room and say, yes, I will implement that. Now, Node does not have this problem. Node just implements it or doesn't implement it. Um, that's one. Uh, and then the second thing is that in the browser, it's actually really, really hard to remove things that have that people have agreed to. So certainly it is possible to remove things that are experimental, um, that have not really made it through the process. All that's fine. Things change all the time. But once something is in a standard, uh, unlike, again, in Node, where they just re rewrote their entire stream system, and everyone's like, sounds good, 010, great. Uh, <laughs> In the browser, if the browser ships a feature, it's really, really hard to remove. So in addition to all the, every, get, having to get everyone to agree, everyone has to agree and feel confident that it's a feature that they will want to support in the future. Um, or at least one that is not future hostile to few other features they may want to implement. So as you can imagine, if you try to put yourself in this room, it will probably take a while. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not things that we can do in the process. Um, I, I, just, I agree with Tim in general that there are, um, that, that you need to think about the context that platforms that billions of people use are designed in and then maybe un think about think about like the f what is the breakneck pace for that process what is the fastest you could possibly do and it's not it's not you know some guy sitting in a bedroom hacking node right it's it's there's some lag that comes from just doing serving a billion people or billions of people now you get uh, oh well I want to I'll disagree up front then and then agree violently um, so the disagreement is on um, uh, what it means to take something away, um, you know, the idea that this, once something has been a consensus, then we can then it's difficult to take away. So right now in the Blink community, we're talking about whether or not we can remove WebKit's prefix CSS properties, which were never standardized, which are used on less than 0.03 percent of all page views. 
is that too many? That's a really freaking huge number of page views, right? Taken in aggregate, 0.03% of the web is a freaking enormous number. Um, are we willing to break those people, right? And, and do we know if we will? We don't even know. Like, how bad will it be? We have no way of knowing. Um, well, we're talking about, you know, what, what does it mean to actually go move this process as fast as possible? Um, so, for instance, we're talking about taking away XSLT support from HTML. Um, we'd like to turn it off. It's a gigantic, enor enormous burden. Um, it's binary size that's hurting everybody who loads a renderer for Blink, right? It's slow. It's big. It's lib XSLT. We'd like not to have it anymore. Um, but some content depends on it. How much is too much? These are really important questions that you get yourself into. Um, and it, and and so that's the upper bound on, on the rate of progress. But I will say that the one thing you can do is also to go ship something. And this this does not this does not make anyone in here, I assume, very happy. But it turns out that the fastest way to change everyone's expectations about what's possible is to make it real in the world. So getting something done in standards requires hubris and then um, a little bit of emo about the humility that you're going to have to take on later to maintain this stuff. You actually need to move faster than is reasonable and hopefully not too fast to turn, tune other people out. Um, and you don't know how big the mess is that you're going to leave behind. You just hope that it's bigger than it is today. All right, some closing notes from Dan on this topic. Sorry, I just wanted to make one more point, which is something that I think we, the community sometimes overlooks, is that W3C has to worry about patents and IPR, too, which can slow down the process on particular things. Intellectual property rights. So um, the, the W3C, everything that comes out of W3C should be royalty-free, should be implementable royalty-free, right? And we want to make sure as much as possible that anything that anything that comes out of W3C you can implement without having to worry that somebody is going to come along and sue you uh, to say uh, by saying you know you've infringed my patent, right? So there's a process that without going into detail because it's extremely boring. There's a process that, that needs to be that needs to be followed in order to do that, and and a lot of what goes on in W3C is in service of that, actually. Um, and it, it's not necessarily visible because if... Because people are, be, people are not getting sued. Actually, there, there are a couple of high-profile cases recently where people have been sued, um, but, but it's very rare. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's one of those things like you don't notice it because it's not happening, but there are an awful lot... I mean, if you're paying attention to the patent space and technology, you know that there's an awful lot of litigation that's happening around patents, around innovation and new technology these days, especially on uh, mobile devices and, uh, and other areas like health and all kinds of stuff that's really holding back innovation. And I think one of the, one of the things that W3C does well is to try and keep that out of the web. Um, but that takes time and it takes energy, and sometimes things get held up because of that. Because some some companies participating in the standard throws a patent, what's called a patent exclusion, in at the last minute, and they say, no, 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 we're actually not willing to license our intellectual property um, under the W3C patent policy, and that stops things. And I'm participating in something right now around the Push API that's in the, uh, the one of the working groups in W3C, where we're going through exactly that process. So. You know. Yeah. What? 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 <laughs> yeah. Touch. So touch and pointer. So the basically that process dragged on. Uh, the TLDR of the process is that there's a, a email that gets sent out that says, "Hey, representative from the W3C, this." thing is about to become, a, or is moving along in the spec process. Do you want to assert patent rights? And um, most of the time, nobody says yes, but occasionally someone says yes. And uh, occasionally people are very mean and or bad actors, and they wait until a, a process has taken a, has already gone through everything, everybody is happy with the technical stuff, and then they say, boom, patent exclusion. Um, and yeah, and that, so basically the reason why Touch has taken so long to standardize is that they went through the whole process of standardizing what Safari put on the web itself as a, as a thing that everyone else wanted to then copy, and then they said, no, actually, even though we put it in a web browser, this is not a thing that, you're, that we are going to allow you to standardize. So 
uh, even though there's a lot of web content that we're telling people to use, sorry, you can't do it. So then Microsoft uh, had the pointer API, which has been moving along. But basically, everybody had to start from scratch. Everyone had to say, oh, I guess we're not going to be able to standardize this thing, which we didn't know about in the beginning until Apple appeared and, and did the exclusion. So sometimes things take long because of patents. Yes, uh, everybody else, I'm being in politics. All right, this is a good tie into the next question. Um, and we only, I think we have another 10 minutes or so. Um, do you think the uh, open web platform is good for people? And should it be a basic human right? Uh, was were the questions from Boas. And I think a nice tie into that is if it were a human right, o Omar asks, like, uh, how will the web change once everyone is on it? Because currently there's about one sixth of the population or so is on the web. What if, what if the other? But if the rest is connected, what will happen? Dan, you're so happy to be here. <laughs> well, I'm on record linking the, the what is it, the um, which article of the UN Declaration of Human Rights is it? That's the freedom of expression. There's a UN Declaration of Human Rights, and one of the articles, uh, Article 7, something like that, is a, uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, freedom of expression, which is roughly speaking equivalent to freedom of speech. And uh, is recognized as a as a universal human right by the, by that uh, declaration, um, and uh, and I think the web is linked to that. And and uh, you know I, I've talked about the right to link before. I know that's a bit that's a bit controversial, but I think the web is an expression or is a is a implementation of the of the of the freedom of expression and the freedom of association and and all kinds of other fundamental human rights. I don't know if that's an answer. Uh, utopia, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we finally get there. Uh, okay. Is it uh, human right? I think people who push, who have been pushing so long for uh, water and healthcare and vaccination to be a human right. And water is a relatively, re relatively, relatively recently officially added to the UN list. Feel what? You know, ha no, hello. You know this. You know, the, the, the lot, and, and, uh, and the people look at the having a web as being having a smartphone and being on the web in African country as being uh, as as being a luxury. And that is a fundamental misunderstanding, because actually, when you talk to people on the ground, they say. Actually, you know, the, the, they tell me about the cases where people have not had water, but have had uh, some old computer and have had some internet connection and have got a job using the internet connection, translating from English into their native language, which they tell in the story they managed to teach themselves by having a copy of the Bible in their native language, a copy of the Bible in English. But uh, they, and so they managed to, with internet connection, they managed to get a job and also managed to by acting as a translator, managed to make a link between the English-speaking world and the, native, the people speaking that particular language. And then that brings in money, and money can bring in the PVC pipe, which brings in the water. So in fact, it's not obvious that you, have to, that you should not think about providing people with connectivity until they've got water and until they get vaccination. Maybe, in fact, one of the important things you can do for healthcare is to get them the connectivity is it's, so one of the things the World Wide Web Foundation is doing is looking, you know, is trying to and it's talking to lots of other organisations and it's trying to figure out how the how all these or all these things connect. Nowadays, of course, it's not in developing countries. It's you know, I, it's in developed. I always put developed in quotes. Um, countries that people are you know are now suddenly realizing wait a moment who can turn off my internet because it's after it got turned off in Egypt and now with the NSA revelations people realize that it's actually you know they realize that actually people can turn off their internet and pe worse people can spy on them watch them use the internet see who their friends are wait until they reveal themselves as being an enemy of this particular uh, administration and then round up all their friends and put them all in jail without a murmur. So the countries where that happens, it's countries where it happens with uh, using very sophisticated technology and using man-in-the-middle attacks, fake certificates produced by you know by the government in deliberately uh, and uh, spying on their citizens. Uh, but nobody, I think, after the Snowden, really thinks that this is uh, this is something that only happens in these bad developing countries anymore. So 
Now, uh, I, I, this question about what rights do we have? If you spy on me as a, as a, uh, if you as a policeman have the right to spy on me, and who's spying on you? Who's, who will guard the guards? And I think no country at the moment has come up with a good question about that. I think most people realize that the law enforcement have to have the power to, sp to, to be able to spy on people, but they haven't got a good story about how it's going to, uh, uh, about how that power is going to be controlled. And I think that uh, we are going to have to have some really serious discussion about it in all nations. And what I'd like to do is use the 25th anniversary of the web. Next year, it's 24 years old. Uh, the first memo I wrote about it in 1989. So that'll be 25 years ago in March. And so w what the what the bunch of organisations. Uh, hopefully, will do is get is just get everybody asking this question: What is the web we want? Actually, what sort of a web do we want to be spied on? If we want to be spied on, what's the deal? You know, come, or, and I think I hope what will come out of that is a charter, like the folks in Brazil have been trying to put a charter for the internet, which says no, we have a actually as an internet user, I have the right not to be uh, spied on, except under certain very specific circumstances, not to be blocked except under very specific circumstances, and those will end up yeah getting list added to the list of human rights and I used to think that it was something you know the, 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 the where we could take our time doing it now I realize it's really really urgent I'm not a utopian I don't believe that technology necessarily makes people's lives better um, technology has demonstrably made many people's lives worse. Um, so the question needs to be formulated in a different phrasing. It needs, I think, to be put in the context of what makes it possible for human lives to flourish. What makes it possible for you to do better by the set of values and morals that you hold dear tomorrow versus today. Um, to encourage yourself to be the better version of you and with regards to the people around you and your society. Um, and that, generally speaking, is not a straight line. Um, and so I think the smartest person in the room is not in the room. Uh, so Clay Shirky wrote an essay for Foreign Policy, uh, so excuse me, the Foreign Affairs Journal, um, just before the uh, quote-unquote Twitter revolution in Egypt and the uprisings all over the Mideast in 2011, I believe. And he basically put your face it this way. There's kind of two different theses about whether or not social media or the internet um, make our lives better. Uh, one of them is the uh, sort of instrumental idea of social change via technology, and the other one is sort of the environmental idea of social change through technology. One of them says, this is a wedge. This is a thing that actually creates change of its own. The more of it you have, the more change you have. The other one says, it is a thing that enables people to get what they want as soon as they can talk to each other. It is a thing that enables an environment in which people can do it. Turns out that technology is a great enabler for control. Look at the Great Firewall of China. Look at our ability now to censor and filter our, our communications with each other and self-censor, right? What are you not saying online now that you know that the NSA is listening? It is a huge detriment to us all to have enabled the ability for governments to create the fear within ourselves not to say what it is we actually think. So. What is it that we should do now? I believe that it's up to us to figure out how to create an environment in which technology creates better opportunities for people and not to treat it like some sort of uh, instrument by the blunt application of which we will have created the better world. It actually requires care. We have to be thoughtful. All right, I think that's a good wrap up. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, yeah, please stick around and finish the pizza uh, and the soda and the beer and come again next time because uh, it will be great again. Thanks to the panelists.